I want to come to this last section of Isaiah 49 from verse 14 to the end. But I, I wanted to remind you that it's connected to what went before. Great promises were given in the first part of this chapter. Remember I showed you that there would be a time when Israel would be an individual. And that he would then be used to save Israel, the people of God. And I suggested to you that this Israel is the Lord Jesus. What you have in the book of Isaiah is a very clear change in chapter 49. From 40 to 48, Israel is the nation. From 49 to 55, you have to look carefully because both the nation and the individual are named. And the works that he would bring about are absolutely incredible. But they do require that we should wait for them. They that wait upon the Lord, chapter 40, shall renew the strength. Verse 23 of the chapter before you, the last line of the verse, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Ours is a day of instant everything, isn't it? From instant custard, that's what comes to mind, to instant entertainment, just at the flick of a switch. You no longer need to go anywhere, you just sit still. And therefore, waiting is hard work. Probably the hardest part of our work. Remember, Isaiah is preaching at least 100 years before Israel goes into captivity and is actually explaining to them how they will come back from captivity. 100 years. That's a long time to wait. But when you understand who God is and that he is working continually, then waiting makes sense. Back in Isaiah 40, verse 31, we are told that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. What a fantastic promise. I want to encourage you this morning to wait. There's a great deal in the chapter before us which addresses that whole subject. The first point is that while you're waiting, you're not forgotten. While you're waiting... You've not been forsaken. And while you're waiting, you've no need to be forlorn. That means without hope. I just found another F to manage my alliteration. You've no need to be forlorn. Pray that God will give us grace to see these things this morning. If you turn your eye first to verse 14, you can see that the people of God were having a hard time waiting. But Zion said... The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. You can almost sympathize with them when you realize the time scale. And perhaps identify them when you recognize the events or lack of them that are taking place in our time. But God's timetable is God's timetable. And he calls on us to wait. And promises us while we do that the Spirit of God will enable us to mount up with wings like eagles, enjoy his presence, and then run, working in the world for his glory. This section is the Lord reassuring Zion that despite what they feel, they are not forgotten. Perhaps the people who read it were those who were in captivity. Those who hung their harps up on the trees because they would not sing the Lord's song in a foreign land. It gives you a little picture, doesn't it? Of how despondent they may well have come. Waiting is often because God is working to sort things out for us and in us. Later in chapter 59 and verse 1, he tells us the arm of the Lord is not shortened that he cannot save. 
And then he goes on to say, but your sins and your iniquities have caused the separation between you and your God. This is the tension of the book of Isaiah, especially this section of it, where there is so much promise and still the problem of the people who are unwilling to wait and to rest. You and I must recognize God's love, must recognize God's care and rest in it, knowing that if there is to be a pause, it's only a pause from our perspective. God's clock is still ticking. Every minute is progressing as he controls it. The Lord looks on his church, and if you remember, in, in is it First Peter or Second Peter, he tells us that judgment must begin at the house of the Lord. God's people, at least this one, needs continual management and sorting out. And God himself is committed to doing that. Way back in the book of Isaiah, chapter 3, those first chapters are a, an eye-opener to the to the wickedness of Israel, you get these words. Moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a jingling with their feet. He draws a picture of a people who are just so self-focused that there needs to be something done about it. Other prophets pick up these themes, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 19, speaking to Zion, to Israel. Listen, the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country in captivity. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images and foreign idols? Proud, pompous individuals, Rampant idolatry. We could have spent forever in chapters 47 and 48 looking at idolatry. These are the reasons that the Lord appears at times to have withdrawn. And we're not conscious of it. Way further on, just in case you think it's only an Old Testament idea. The Lord says to the church at Laodicea, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. What's the Lord waiting on? His people to come and allow him to examine him by the word and then to come back to him. But instead, you see what happens. They allow circumstances to eclipse the wonder of God's love and they then go on to moaning and complaining. Isn't that one of the charges against the number of people that were brought out of Egypt? They were always moaning and complaining rather than living by faith and trusting God, ready to slight God's character. Let's be very clear. That while you might rehearse the words of verse 14 about some of your own circumstances, they're not true. The next two verses will make that very clear. But we do need to talk to ourselves and understand that at all times and in every way, God is for us. Romans chapter 8. And therefore, it does not matter who or what or when is ever against us. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And yet I've heard myself groan and complain. Why, why, why? The word comes out without any excuse. I need to see things through the Bible. I need to see things as God sees them. It's interesting in this passage, this use of the word Zion. We looked a little at it very briefly on Thursday night, but that word Zion is helpful too. If you remember the history of Jerusalem, it was once a Jebusite city. And David's 
soldiers bravely entered that city and conquered it and gave it to him. That original part was Zion. David then went on to build the city and that name was then used for the whole city. But in the Bible, it, is, it changes its focus until it's talking about the Lord's people. In chapter 51, if your Bible's open, in verse 16, you find these words. And I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundation of the earth and say to Zion, you are my people. So Zion is not simply that piece of territory that David captured. Zion is taken now for the people of God. And I'm persuaded that that fits in with the message of the book of Isaiah. You remember that these are a wicked people who are in the midst of judgment. That's why they end up in captivity. And that Isaiah was commissioned to preach to a people who would never listen. Chapter 6. But he's given the promise that there will be a remnant. And as I've meditated on this and considered it, it, it occurs to me that, that Zion would appear to be the name for the remnant as opposed to the whole nation. And it will occur over and over as we go through this book of Isaiah. That even when his people are way off the rails, God has a people among them and has always and will always, even in days like the ones that you and I live in. And so the Lord would challenge them as he challenges you and me this morning to understand that while we, while you, while I might feel at times forsaken and forgotten, it's just not true. How do I know it's not true? Because the Savior has promised, you see, I will never, how long is never, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's not because he has moved away that we are not conscious of him. It's usually because there are things that need sorting out. And if that's the case and we look across the, the present day church scene, you don't have to look very far before you find places where God needs to bring people to humility and, and repentance. It was suggested to me earlier or later last month, or it was, I was reminded later last month, that in the book of Proverbs, God hates pride. And here we are in what they call the Pride Month. There are seven things God hates, and one of them is pride. And we need to see a complete reversal of all that wickedness. And while we are waiting, praying, working, you and I need to reject the thinking of Israel. God has a purpose. That purpose is absolutely right on course and will not fail. He will never leave his people, I've got written here. And then highlighted, nor will he fail to correct us. The scriptures are clear. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And so as Christians, every day in our prayer time, we're going to be asking God to show us anything that's a barrier to him working in our lives. We're going to be asking him for the grace and help to overcome it. We're going to be rejoicing in the fact that Jesus has broken the power of sin. The pain that Israel were to go through was not just a political occurrence. It was a call from God to Israel, to Zion, to reset their course, to come in repentance, and to believe that they would indeed triumph over it. Dear friends, it's important that you can see 
beyond the clouds. I have here an account of a, a mountaineer who wanted to climb a very high mountain. And the guide was to take him up and the gentleman noticed it was terrible weather. And there were very, a great amount of clouds. And he says to his guide, oh, we won't go today. There's no point in going up in the clouds. And the guide corrected him. He says, no, this is the very day to go. Because once you get through the clouds, you'll see the sun is still shining. The light is still there. There will be clouds, dear friends. Some of you have been through them this year. Some of you might even still be in them. But God has not moved. I nearly said an inch. Yeah, you're old enough to remember what an inch is. God has not moved at all. He's still working his purposes out. And that's where faith comes in. And when we start saying he's forgotten me, he's forsaken me, faith has been switched off. Ask God for the grace of faith that the word might feed you and the spirit apply it. And then recognize that unbelievers are actually trapped in this terrible world of unbelief, pain and suffering. We can hardly imagine what it must be like to live in parts of Ukraine today. The Russian attack just decimating everything, destroying for the sake of destroying. What kind of outlook? One old lady was crying. I watched her on the news. I've been in my house for 70 years and now I know I can never go back. Horrendous. But without Christ, that's all they've got. And that's even more horrible. Oh, dear friend, if you're not a believer, understand that God is speaking in these present day troubles and calling you to repentance and faith in Christ. He's not forgotten. And he has not forsaken me. The very idea is ridiculous. The very idea is invalid. God's love and relationship for his people is eternal, fixed and sure. And that's what he's going to explain to you in verses 15 and 16. The connection between God and his people is so secure that he will never abandon us nor leave us. So you have to cast all your doubts to the wind. Because God will never stop loving his own people. He will never throw us out. But he will often chasten, correct and redirect us. So whatever you're feeling, allow verses 15 and 16 to become an anchor for your soul. I've seen these verses used over the years by many people who find in them great strength and comfort. Put them in their context and they become even more significant. The Lord had told Israel they would never be cast off. And then when he came as Israel, remember the individual? On the cross at Calvary, he himself was forsaken. Eli Lama, Eli Lama Sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Answer the question, why was Christ forsaken on the cross so that you and me never would be? And that's the beauty and the wonder of the love of God in Christ. So that no matter what I'm feeling, I can go back there and say, because he was forsaken, I am secure. And now nothing, that's right, in heaven above or earth below is able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8. Nothing. Now go back to the passage and let me show you some of the pictures that the Lord uses through the prophets. It's such a profound concept that God picks two very specific pictures to communicate the beauty of it, we, we understand pictures better than words at times, don't we? And that's what 
you have here. Can a woman forget her nursing child? The answer, dear friend, is normally no. And not have compassion on the son of her womb. Surely they may forget. And it is true, some, some women somewhere have forgotten their children and abandoned them. They've no sense of bonded with them. But God wants that illustration, the normal side of it, to enter your mind as a picture. Can you imagine a mother just refusing to feed her baby? The words here refer to um, breastfeeding, where the child gets its life from the mother. Can you imagine a mother saying it's not going to happen? And then he pauses. You might just, but... The last line of verse 15, yet I will not forget you. Yet I will not forget you. Notice the I, it's emphatic. I will not forget you. This is the eternal living God speaking. I will not forget you. Maybe you need to make this a favorite verse and underline that part of it. Because I can guarantee you somewhere in the next days, months or years, you're going to feel like you've been abandoned. You have not. There is a bottom to the pit that you sink into. And as the Lord told Israel, underneath are the everlasting arms. You cannot fall out of God's love. You cannot get to the point where he will say you're no good and I made a mistake by calling and choosing you. I will not forget you. And then just in case you have any questions or doubts, he goes on, doesn't he? See! One of my commentaries quite helpfully says, see is a demonstrative word. And it suggests stopping and looking. And that in the picture, God is extending his hands to you. It would be his right hand, wouldn't it? And he's saying, see, you're written on the palm of my hand. And if you don't see anything else here this morning, see that, dear friend. You ever write on the back of your wrist or the palm of your hand? I do from time to time. People tell me off, you'll get blood poisoning, but it's really useful, isn't it? Your old brain switches off, but whoa, what was that there for? There's a second illusion in this. And that is in ancient times, if you were a slave, it would be written on the palm of your hand. It would be tattooed in. So unlike the ink from the pen, there isn't any soap in the world that can remove it. And so the Lord says to Israel, who feel forsaken and forgotten... See, the Savior stretched his hands out on Calvary. And in every one of those prints of the nails, God says to you, see, I love you. I gave myself for you. And now, dear friend, because that has happened, you are mine, mine, mine. I know you are mine. Oh, dearly beloved, I, I, I hope and pray to be able to communicate something of the wonder of these two verses to you. They really are worth a bookmark. As a father pities his children, the psalmist wrote, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Hosea 14, 4. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from them. I will heal their backsliding. This is what the Lord is doing. And that's why there might be a time when you feel that you're on your own. You're not. 
loved with everlasting love, saved by grace that love to know, his forever, only his. My dear friends, the words of the scriptures are beautiful and we have no reason ever to think See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. That's a wee bit obscure. But in the context of them coming back from captivity, what the Lord is saying, I can see Jerusalem rebuilt. At least that was one of the explanations, and it seemed to make some sense. Are you aware that you are more secure than the planet itself? One day the whole planet will be melted and recycled, won't it, Peter tells us. But that your relationship to God is more secure than such a thing. And although we might let go of God, he never lets go of us. John chapter 10, isn't it? We're in the Son's hand. We're in the Father's hand. And one of my favorite verses, Psalm 37, verse 24, 24. Though he fall, he shall not fall headlong. Why? Because the Lord upholds him with his hand. I felt that hand so often. And I know you have too. Let's recognize that that is Vital evidence that Christ's love towers over time. And although things might not be going at the speed that you and I would like them to go, or, or even happening as we would like them to happen, yet God is in the heavens and working all things after the counsel of his own will. That all things are working together for good to them that love God. It's not just nice words to say. It's scriptural truth. We cannot be deserted. You and I are children of God. And we almost need to repent of complaining. Again, the unbeliever, dear friends, I need to speak to any who hear this. To recognize that there's only one place of security. I read a story yesterday, I've read it before, about W.P. Mackay. He's the author of the hymn, Revive Us Again. He was brought up in the Western Islands of Scotland. And he was a rebel. His mother prayed for him. The story said he even saw and heard his mother praying for him. But he refused to follow Christ. His mother had given him a, a, a Bible when he was young, hoping that it would be read and used by him. Mr. Mackay left home, became a medical doctor with great skill. And one day he was called. He was called to attend to a man who had fallen off a scaffolding. And apparently he was in a terrible condition. But he kept on saying, bring me the book. Bring me the book. And one of his workmates went home and found that the book was the Bible and they brought it and it brought comfort to him. As Mr. Mackay had to finally um, pronounce his demise, they were gathering up the things and the book was there. And somebody gave it to Mr. Mackay and lo and behold, it was the very book his mother had given him. He'd sold it because he had no interest in the gospel. But in God's grace, there it was still with his name inside the front cover. And God used it. Loved with everlasting love. Saved by grace. That love to know. Do you feel it? Do you know it? Are you enjoying it? The last part of the chapter is really quite complex. It's an announcement and reminder to Israel that they are coming back to the land. And that's what you get from verse 17. Let me see right through to verse 21. That's a description. But it contains within the description something which uh, I only saw this morning as I was reading another book. That when they come back, there will be children that they don't know who they are. 
and the writer I read suggested, that's because they're not um, descended from Jews. It's a picture that keeps on coming up in the book of Isaiah. That finally and ultimately, when, when the people of God are reestablished through the death of Christ, then there will be multitudes from all over the world. You remember how chapter 49 began? Listen, O coastlands. It was an announcement to the whole world. That Israel were being dealt with. And that when they were returned to the land, they would be established. And then way down in verse 22, which is really the only verse I want to focus on. You have this reference to how and why God gathers these people from the world. Behold, I will lift my hand in an oath to the nations. To the nations. And set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Here, dear friends, is a, a beautiful picture anticipating the, the, the cross of Christ. That surely is his standard for the peoples. Jesus' own words, I, if I be lifted up, will, can you finish it? Draw all men to myself. And that has always been God's purpose. And so the Jews who had the privilege of all that history refused Christ. And yet when the preaching of the gospel began, they always went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And many Jewish people were brought into the kingdom of God. When Paul writes, I think it's Romans 10, 1, has God forsaken his people? And he says, no, look at me. A very bad paraphrase. I'm a Jew. I'm converted. I'm in Christ. And then you find the apostle, isn't it, Peter, saying to the Jews, if you won't receive the gospel, I'll turn to the Gentiles. And I think it was Paul. And there's been this great thrust of the gospel going to the Gentiles. Jews have been being converted and added to the church. And then the, 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 the intriguing passages from Romans chapter 11 and verse 26, etc. Speaks about a day when there will be a new work of grace amongst the Jewish people and they will be brought into the church. And then it says... Can you imagine what the world's going to be like? This is the picture that's given in Scripture. Romans 11, 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more? Their fullness. What do you think the future looks like? It doesn't look very good at present, does it? Hunger. Inflation. War. And it would be very easy to be like Israel and to go, Oh, God's forgotten all about us. No, he says. It's impossible. I gave my son for you. His precious blood was spilt with a purpose. A purpose to save. A purpose that will save. And a purpose, dear friends, which has to challenge our negative perspective on the future. Verses like Romans, from, those from Romans 11, are a profound challenge to us using the words of William Carey, to expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Will there ever be the day when there are too few seats in this chapel? I believe it could happen. But it will depend on you and I being who we know ourselves to be 
and, and, and spreading that wonderful truth. That little newspaper has been going to homes now for over a year. Seeds. Or maybe better, time bombs. Pray that God would waken the dead and begin here in Middleton. Oh, you think it'll never happen. I think that myself. The lady who told me not to deliver it anymore last month. It's not appropriate for this household. I tried to explore it, but she wasn't having it. We need to pray that God would do that work, which is his work and his alone. You need to pray and expect God to change the world, even through a little hobbling community of believers like us. The only gospel church for 20 miles in any direction. I sometimes forget how remote we are. Kath got a letter this last week and she, she needs to go and see a doctor about something. So the, the, the lady was apologetic. The only person we can find is 24 miles away in York. Are you willing to go that distance? There would be a time where I would have said, what? 24 miles, but nowadays around here, it's just normal. If you want anything, you have to travel. And you need to be expected to travel. It makes a difference, doesn't it? Instead of throwing your hands up in the air and forlorn, you're actually, oh yeah, that'll be a good thing. And I put it to you that what the scriptures have before us is this great challenge that we have to expect God to do incredible things, even yet. And that's why God's people should never be forlorn. We have a blessed hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Hope is the driving force of God's love at work in our life, surely. Hope and confidence that every one of God's elect will be saved throughout the whole world before Christ returns. Matthew 24 this gospel shall be preached to the ends of the earth, then the end will come. Not the war in Ukraine or the famine or whatever. Then. And if that's the case, then I need to have the faith to say it's my business to promote it. Take an interest in missionary work. Take an interest in evangelism. Look for opportunities rather than just drifting along. Where can I help? Where can I put my little tuppence worth in to, to, to make the gospel go and do what it's promised to do? When you understand some of God's promises, it takes your breath away. Israel were to remember, you see, that God was fighting for them. Way down in verse 25. Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. Why? For I will contend with him who contends with you. I will contend with him who is on the Lord's side. That's how we started, wasn't it? I'm thankful he's on my side and I'm expecting him to show the way forward. Oh, dear friends, are you waiting on God? One minute left. I do wide-ranging research, and sometimes I use video to look at, and YouTube's a great source of video. David Posson's been brought to my attention recently. And he, he, he does a series right through the Bible explaining every book. And I would commend to you his overview of Isaiah, Part one brings out some incredible facts about the book of Isaiah. The whole of Isaiah was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. A complete scroll of Isaiah. And when they checked it against the one that we had, there were 
so few differences, it wasn't changed. He went on then to say something I hadn't noticed. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah. There are 66 books in the Bible. And there are 39 and 27 when you divide the Old and New Testament. And the Old Testament is really an account of man's sin and failure. He says, if you read the book of Isaiah, you'll find that the first 39 chapters, with a little bit of an exception here and there, are an account of man's failure. And then you'll find that the remaining, get the numbers right, 27 chapters can be divided into three groups of nine. And right in the middle of the middle group is Isaiah 53, verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. This book which God has given us is incredible. Could these things have happened by accident? Do you think Isaiah sat down and worked it out? So it would all. Holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. And they then wrote as the Holy Spirit instructed. Oh, dear friends, this book of Isaiah has at least two purposes. One, to remind us that we are sinners and deserve judgment. And two, that the God of grace and mercy loves his people and will save us to the very end. Why? Not because we'll improve. But because he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Are you willing to wait on God? Wait on him in faith, believing. Tell the devil to go find somebody else to torment because God has spoken and what he says is more certain than however much or little you've got in the bank. May it please God to enable us to mount up with wings like eagles, to run the gospel race and not be weary. Amen. Hymn number 493. Ah, right. A lovely time to sing Stuart Townend's hymn, isn't it? How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch. Do you recognize your name? His treasure. For those who are listening online, I need to turn the sound off for copyright reasons. Where are we? 493.